for joining us today, Max. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm Dan Gumpright. Um, I'm VP of Products here at Fris. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself uh, briefly, and then we can kick off this conversation. Great. Well, thank you uh, for inviting me to have this conversation. I'm Max Bazerman, and I'm a professor at the Harvard Business School at Harvard University. Thanks, Max. Um, I'm a huge fan of your work, uh, especially your latest book that I had the privilege to read prior to this chat. Um, so I'm both excited and genuinely honored uh, to have a general chat with you um, and ask some of my burning questions uh, related to behavioral science in the business world um, that I and some of my colleagues uh, put together prior to this call. Um, and in your latest book, I happen to uh, notice that you uh, you stated that you like the idea of helping to create a more uh, honest insurance system. So uh, we're hoping we can learn a little bit more about your experience in this space um, from a more academic perspective. Great, happy to. So, um, uh, so my, my new book, Better Not Perfect, um, is about how to make the how to make the world better and to create a better life for yourself in the process. And um, one of the ways to create value is to reduce the degree to which we have corruption, creating friction, and reducing value. So um, I've I, I've I've done a moderate amount of work in the world of insurance, and um, when I see dysfunctional conflict taking resources from both sides, um, I see that as a missed opportunity. So in order to figure out how do we create a more honest, transparent, and simple insurance process is something that I find absolutely intriguing. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. So uh, I'll get right to it because uh, our BHAG or big, hairy, audacious goal uh, as a company is actually to make insurance more honest. Um, we believe insurance is really fundamental to everyday life. Um, you know, I'm not sure people realize quite how crucial it really is. Uh, the ability to drive a car, the ability to open and operate a business, uh, to generally um, transfer financial and other risks um, to another party. Um, and I feel like the industry desperately needs this to be uh, more honest um, and move to this honest uh, fashion. So. Our objective as a company isn't just to detect fraud, um, but also to help carriers uh, to prevent fraud before it occurs, whether a, a policy inception or a claim, and to help incentivize opportunistic individuals not to defraud their, their insurance company, even by a small amount. Um, and at the same time, we, we truly want to help our insurance customers be able to treat and trust their customers um, as fairly as they possibly can. So I'm going to start with uh, with the most fundamental uh, and underlying question, and we'll, and we'll go from there. Um, is uh, our, so our mission as a company is to make insurance more honest. Uh, is this overly optimistic, or is it realistic, in your opinion? I think it's realistic. I think it's necessary, and I think it's going to happen. Um, so when when I look at uh, the insurance industry. Um, in the early part of the new millennium, I see a shockingly inefficient system where you have very large companies with thousands of employees and very tall buildings um, who are devoted toward a task that should be relatively simple. I mean, the idea of insurance is you pay a premium and then when you have a claim, you, you get paid for the claim. And the, what makes this process complicated is um, lack of transparency and honesty, but I would add uh, often on both sides. So we have a very strange system where insurance companies are appropriately concerned about fraud by the policyholders, but then you turn it around and you talk to policyholders who are very concerned about the fact that insurance companies don't easily pay many claims that should be very easy to pay on a fast and efficient basis. And as the two parties don't trust each other, each party feels more reason and more justification for their own behaviors. And as a result, the people who make money out of this process are the lawyers who get paid to help us deal with disputes, many of these being disputes that didn't have to occur 
to begin with. So um, Fris is certainly a leader in the business of fraud detection, and that's part of the solution. It's an important part of the solution. Um, and I think that fraud detection is becoming more pop more possible with the AI advances the companies like Fris are working on. But I think that there's a broader set of changes that are going to occur. So if you can imagine a future where there are insurance companies that use artificial intelligence to prevent and detect fraud and also are reliable partners on the other side paying 97% of their claims within three seconds of the claim being submitted online, then all of a sudden you're going to have efficient insurers out there and the inefficient companies that spend billions of dollars, literally billions of dollars on legal fees to, to delay paying the claims um, just aren't going to be competitive anymore. So I think that we're going to, over the next 10 to 20 years, see fundamental changes with some very big gainers in the industry, but also some significant losers. And the losers are going to include insurance companies who continue to do it, to do business as is because the existing system just creates an opportunity for new entrants because of the inefficiencies that exist in the current system. Yeah, it's really interesting. So I, uh, I kind of, I, so this question always comes to my mind: Is the model of insurance fundamentally broken? Uh, so you state uh, actually in the latest book, uh, Better Not Perfect, um, that insurance companies spend too much money on not paying claims. Uh, so effectively, the fact that insurance companies financially benefit from not paying claims that impacts the psychology of an individual claiming against them and effectively may even induce them to cheat even in a small way um, because they simply see the claiming process as a negotiation process uh, or the start of a negotiation process. So do you believe that, that that model, that kind of historic model of insurance is fundamentally broken and needs to be changed uh, like a lot of the new insurtechs are doing? Yes, uh, is a simple answer. But, but now let's go put this into his into a broader history. Um, so insurance was invented as a modern industry in London, and typically it was invented with some mutuality, where in many cases the pol the policyholders were also the owners of a mutual insurance company. There was a society, and the purpose of insurance was created with the best of intent. That is a group of similar, uh, perhaps business owners would pull their risk together. And then when um, a, a liability, a claim actually occurred, um, they would collectively share the burden. And um, what they wanted to do was to create a, a lower risk environment for all of them with some notion that the job on the claims function is to pay legitimate claims rather than to fight against them. Somewhere we went astray. So Jay Feynman in his book, uh, Delay, Deny, Defend, um, traces this to some changes in the 1980s, 1990s, where insurance companies began to think of, about reducing the payment of claims as a profit opportunity. And undoubtedly, some of that is true. The, the sort of the magnitude, um, I'm sure different parties would question. But I've done plenty of work with very large insurers, and I've met plenty of people on the claim side who view the less money they pay, the more successful they are, which is a bit different than saying, how do I efficiently pay an honest claim um, uh, as, as timely and as honestly as possible? Um, this is complicated because there are policyholders out there who act in fraudulent ways, both organized fraud, but also sort of your typical homeowner who simply pads their claim a bit in anticipation of the insurance company not acting honestly. And this slows down the insurance company. So the question is, how do we take the friction out? And I think part of the answer is coming up with um, a sort of a reciprocal process 
of greater trust and greater honesty. And, and, and whether it's fair or not, the burden is on the insurance company to create this change of structure. And I think that there are going to be organizations, there are insurance companies, who are going to be transformed, partially because of the movement online but also the uh, sort of using behavioral science, artificial intelligence to create a fundamentally different way of interacting. So um, I, I mentioned I, I've worked with very big insurance companies. Um, and more recently, I've spent a lot of time with um, a company called Slice Labs um, that's based out of New York and Ottawa. Um, and um, they are in, they have their own product in terms of a home share product, but they're really in the business of providing technology to big insurers on how to create new new insurance products online that have all the technical benefits of efficiency both on the uh, on the underwriting side but also on the claim side. But a significant part of what Slice is up to is creating a more honest interface, um, which requires honesty from the insurer in ways that can induce dramatically greater honesty from the policyholder as well. And if you now imagine insurance companies that exist in the not too distant future who are lowering their costs dramatically, Okay, both administratively in terms of the payment of legal fees, um, the traditional model just isn't going to be able to compete. So I think that a revolution is, a, is occurring. The kind of work that Frist is doing in terms of fraud detection is part of it. But I think that there is a broader movement that in, certainly includes fraud prevention to go along with fraud detection, coupled with reciprocity in terms of honesty and integrity and transparency from the insurance company. Yeah, so we do, we, we actually, uh, I'm familiar with Slice and um, I know you mentioned it in the book as well. And we, we do a lot of uh, work with insurance companies who, um, you know, predominantly have a chatbot interface, uh, at least at first notice of loss, um, or a, an AI interface that deals with a large number of uh, smaller claims. Um, and we work with them to, uh, determine which ones of those are uh, potentially opportunistic fraud, uh, which ones have uh, have um, have been part in a, a kind of a scheme to inflate uh, claims. Uh, what I've also done in the past is actually work with um, work with insurance companies at the point of quote, where there's effectively just a quoting engine, um, and it prompts them with additional questions during that quoting process, uh, not necessarily to uh, to throw them out of the system because they may be fraudulent, but to prompt them that, okay, maybe maybe your item is worth a little less than you're stating, um, or maybe you're, you're missing out some vital information that will lead to policy leakage uh, within our insurance company. So trying to create that fairer structure. So I, I want to ask you a, uh, a slightly different, um, a different question, because uh, this is something I discussed uh, fairly regularly with our uh, our CTO and one of the co-founders of Fris, um, who's very interested in the mission of honest insurance. Um, again, in, in your book, you talk about corruption across the industry. You you know a really upsetting fact that you uh, that you mentioned earlier um, that both sides in an insurance claim, the insurance carrier and the insured, tend to act in a uh, you call it a corrupt um, or a dishonest manner to counter the expected or predicted corruption of the other side. So it's kind of a, um, it, it's corruption on both sides because the, the other side expects corruption on the other side. So if as an insurance company, I would theoretically give my customers full transparency about how I assess their risks, how I price them, um, how, and potentially how I assess them for fraud or score them for fraud. Um, negating the organized fraud, which we can kind of answer obviously would uh, get worse. Would that regain trust for the general, um, the general person claiming against their policy? Or would that increase the potential for opportunistic fraud? So in a summary, if we effectively provided an entirely white box 
Uh, would this encourage people to find ways to manipulate the system? Or based on behavioral science experiments, would it actually motivate people uh, to be more honest? Yeah, so, so I don't see in the short term an insurance company saying, let, us, let me share with you all of our algorithms that we use for paying the claims that you submit. Rather, um, I think of it m much more in terms of being clear about the processes that you use, the fact that you do use artificial intelligence to detect fraud, that you do use external information providers um, to find out their historical patterns. Um, th that seems fine. I think it's fine to, to be clear with them um, uh, that the fact that if, if you can detect fraud, um, the, the positive side is it allows you to pay claims a whole lot faster. Um, I think that if you can tell them that, the, that, that, that you have processes in place that are meant to encourage the claimant to be as honest as possible, and the reason is that you're going to reciprocate and be as honest as possible, um, that, um, that you can provide a lot of the steps that you're taking that are more meaningful without giving away any of the details um, that would allow an abusive policyholder to use that information against you. So again, I, I, I envision this future, and I, and I, I, I don't know who's going to solve the puzzle, and I don't know whether it's going to be three years away or 15 years away, but I think we are going to get to the point where there are going to be insurance companies that have very digitally focused claim systems that are going to be able to pay an extraordinarily large percent of the claims within seconds rather than in days or weeks. And I think providing that quality of service um, gives you full right to clarify why 3% or 7% of the claims do in fact require further investigation. Um, but no, not only have I um, uh, advised insurance companies, but occasionally I even buy the product. And, um, and you know, I've been through claims processes, and I've been through claims processes that are impressive and well done, and I've been through, quite frankly, ridiculous claims processes. And, and um, the most recent ridiculous claims process that I had was in our, we have a home in Vermont, and um, a neighbor, shall we say, four miles away, cut down a tree, um, creating a power surge to 60 different houses, including ours, creating damage of something, let's say $20,000. So a, a number of air conditioning heating units went out as a result. And um, I didn't talk to any bad human being. Um, I didn't talk to, uh, to anybody who I know lied to me, but the ridiculous processes that the insurance company took me through in order to pay a simple legitimate claim from somebody who actually did nothing to cause the problem, it's quite ridiculous. And um, the, the amount of friction and the amount of money that the insurance company spent to interact with an honest claimant yeah. is just a loss. So. Better Not Perfect is about how to create more value in society. And, and my reaction is, if they could have saved me the aggravation of dealing with them, and if they could have saved themselves the amount of time and effort and visits to look at the equipment, um, the world could have just been a whole lot better off. Now, this is one tree, but there were 60 households that were affected, and I'm just one of those. So if, if you start to sort of multiply the magnitude of this inefficiency, we can see the opportunity that's going to be out there. Do so think I, think that, um, I think that there's many pieces that can be very transparent, and there's probably some that can't. Okay? Um, we can also, you can also be more transparent about the fact that you're using uh, leading behavioral science to ask questions that will induce people to be more honest. So uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I've seen on many um, claim forms the question, what was your item worth? So let's make it specific. What was your TV worth? Okay. 
I'll, I'll state categorically that from a behavioral science perspective, that's a completely ridiculous question. Okay, what's it worth? I mean, I love TV, um, so it's worth a tremendous amount to me. Okay, that's I don't think what the insurance company meant. Okay, did you want to know what it was worth when I bought it eight years ago? Probably not. Um, what you probably want to know is what would it cost if I went on Amazon and looked for a parallel TV today? Um, and that's a far better question. And you could even imagine, would you mind going to Amazon and finding a similar TV and send us a link to the TV that you think comes closest to matching yours, where I can see the price? So when we start thinking about how we cr create the claims process, we can see opportunities to create value by creating more honesty, integrity, accountability, and the answers that our claimant is going to provide to us. So do you think the, um, that's a, it's a super interesting uh, story and example. Do you think the people uh, involved in um, handling your claim and creating the friction uh, effectively felt like they were against you in the process, or maybe they were trained, um, maybe not actively trained, but inherently yeah. trained to act against you in the process that caused this friction throughout. So rather than working together to solve the claim, it was a working against you to work out what was real and what was not. So, so let's, so, so in this claim in question, there's an insurer who, and when you add up the 60 claims, it brought in the relevance of a reinsurer. And then we have a claims company, that was, uh, an adjusting company that was hired, who then hired a subcontractor. So we can start to see the different layers. So there's a perfectly nice gentleman in Maine who's multiple steps away from the insurance company, who's told to make sure that this claim is real, okay? and um, he's simply doing the job that was assigned to him. And I don't have any evidence that anyone else along the line um, was doing anything dishonest or wasn't doing their job either. Mm. So that means that somebody who set up this system has done something wrong in terms of creating a high friction system to deal with an honest claimant who you should want to solve the problem with as efficiently as possible. So when I get sort of annoyed at the inefficiency in the legacy systems, I don't get annoyed at the frontline adjuster. I get annoyed at the executives who are accepting the fact that they oversee this dramatically inefficient system. Yeah, it's interesting. We so one of the uh, one of the reasons I like being in this industry, and one of the the reasons I like what we do, is we we sell Pris, um, obviously uh, to insurance carriers. Uh, but the the mantra by which I talk about Pris is not uh, that we detect fraud or that we prevent fraud. But one of the key things that I think we enable insurers to do is to distinguish what is likely to be fraud and what is not so that you can actually pay the majority of your customers faster. So I actually uh, I, I uh, did a video, um, this is a shameless plug for this, um, <laughs> a video a few weeks ago um, where we spoke about the the similarities between what we do and the surveillance in a store like the Amazon Go store, where we have some cameras watching you, right? We have some algorithms watching you, and we're going to distinguish whether what you're doing is okay or not. And mm -hmm. if it's okay, you get through the system fast. You hardly have to be looked at. And if it's not okay, then we look at you and it takes a bit longer. And what we aim is for way greater than 90% of the claimants. Uh, and the policyholders to just go through the system. And that, I think, is the the cool thing about what we do. It's not the stopping fraud. Yes, stopping fraud saves money. But I actually think that the uh, the generation of revenue that comes from treating your customers fairly is far greater over time. 
right? So mm -hmm. short-term losses are saved from fraud, but the longer-term experience that you would have had, for example, in that, you know, in that scenario would have been far better. And you may be a customer for the next 20 years without another claim. So I think that that's just terrific. And, and what I would add to that is we, not only does fraud detection help you pay the vast majority of the claims faster, but if we can add in pr fraud prevention, that will help. And if you want to prevent fraud, one of the ways to do that is to be honest yourself and how you deal with the claimant. And, and again, if we take my sort of my story from Vermont, I'm not claiming anyone was um, dishonest, but I'm, I am claiming that there was a ridiculous amount of friction left in the system, left in the system by the insurance industry. And when we can take that out, we're going to have a better system that where the prices are going to be more competitive and the firms that are going to adapt are going to be more competitive insurance companies 10 years from now. So uh, moving on to actually some of the uh, more kind of behavioral psychology uh, business techniques that you've worked on, such as um, what you just noted to uh, to work on prevention of fraud and not only detection. Uh, I get really excited by uh, behavioral psychology related experiments that are trialed uh, by insurance companies. Um, so I was actually rather disappointed to read your recent publication that the uh, the signing first experiment uh, experiment wasn't actually as as, as successful um, as originally expected, and there was uh, very little statistical relevance uh, to the change. And just for people listening who are uh, less familiar with the experiment, uh, it was exploring whether making someone sign um, at the uh, at the start of a form, so whether it's a claims form uh, or a tax return form, rather than signing at the end to state their honesty, um, they'd be more likely to answer honestly whilst filling in the form because they've already acknowledged uh, that they are honest. Um, what did you learn from this expected outcome? And actually, were there any were there any success stories in the midst of numerous organisations uh, trying this out? Uh, around the world in real life. And then the, the follow-up question to that is, um, why do these experiments fail uh, to bring the results in uh, that are expected in real life when they are quite good at providing statistically significant results in the lab? Um, <laughs> that's, uh, it's always interesting to me. So two so, questions. Uh, so uh, maybe more than two questions. So, so I'll do my best, and then you can follow up as you see fit. So um, um, you can probably tell by looking at me, I'm I'm not new to this research activity. I've been doing this for a long time. I've published a lot of academic papers, and in my career, um, I have um, one result that I would say has failed to replicate and and you and you've brought it up so let me sort of describe paper 1 and paper 2 um, so in the um, in 2012 um, there's a paper uh, led by Lisa Shu SHU and the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and we provide three studies two lab based and one a field based study involving an insurance company actually um, and um, we claim to show in that paper that um, that when you if you can have people sign before they fill out the form they tend to be more honest than if you have them sign afterwards and this paper was published I'm the fifth author of five authors and I would say not only did I like and believe that study but I taught that message in many classes um, and um, the, the simple notion of signing first was amazingly um, pleasing to lots of people who basically went ahead and implemented it. They moved the signature. Um, and um, and I'll, I'll start with the good news. I don't think anybody was harmed dramatically by moving a signature up. Um, but the bad news is what I now believe, for reasons that I'll describe in a minute, I, I don't think that they were helped much either. So, um, so the, the, there's good logic for why this might work. Um, but when um, a, 
a, a, a broader team of researchers led by Ariella Crystal started to look at how do we get people to tell the truth online. Um, then um, we basically tried to replicate the signing first result without success. Um, and then we tried it again without success. And by the seventh failure to replicate, we went ahead and published a newer paper um, that included the two new leading authors who weren't part of the original team, but also the five original authors on a paper in the same journal, um, the Proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences, where we basically reported a failure to replicate the signing first result. So if you ask me today, do I confidently believe that moving the signature up helps a lot? I would say, no, I don't have much confidence that that is an effective procedure. Um, so, um, so in retrospect, I wish I never published the 2012 paper, but I did, and I did it with good conscience, uh, uh, with a good conscience about it, and I believe the result. Um, but when a dramatic, with an overabundance of data, comes in that um, that shows that you can't replicate it, then it's time to quit arguing that companies should necessarily do this. I want to repeat, I'm not arguing that it was bad to move the signature up first. I'm just arguing that there isn't very strong evidence that it did anybody a whole lot of good. If you ask me today, but you got to put the signature somewhere, where would you put it? Um, I would lean toward first over last, but, but without expectation that it would do a lot of good. Now, I mentioned Slice Labs, um, who I've worked with on their claims process a significant amount. And so you might ask, that this is an online claims process um, where people sign online. Um, where is it? Is it first or last? And the answer, it's first, okay? But it, it's, um, it's mutually first. So not only is a, claim, is, a, is a claimant asked to sign, but Slice Labs signs first as well, promising to act in a variety of high integrity ways to reciprocate the behavior of the claimant. And Slice Labs um, basically is a, is a technology provider at this point selling to other insurance companies. And they certainly encourage people to mutually sign on the front end. So, and, and what I'm emphasizing here is that I think that signing first is more likely to be good than bad, but not dramatically. But we can supercharge that through a reciprocal process. And this goes to the theme that I brought up multiple times. It's a lot easier to create a new insurance system that has more honesty in both directions than it is to simply get the claimant to be more honest. So, so I, I want to engage insurance companies and the goal of how can they be more honest. Earlier you were asking, should they be full, fully transparent about everything? And my answer is no. I don't think that most claimants want to um, look at your algorithm, which they can't understand anyhow. But there are many things that they could do, in, in, including clarifying um, the honesty that the insurance company plans to engage in as part of the process as well. Okay. So I'm not sure if I've answered your question on signing first, but uh, that's um, kind of what I how I currently think about this process and what I think I know as a scientist. Were there any uh, kind of good anomalous results um, in yeah. the batch of people that did do it? I know overall uh, yeah. there were no kind of statistical um, differences, but did you notice any good yeah. uh, good results from insurance companies and authorities that did change it. So, so Dan, if, if, if I was here to sell you on the idea of, of signing first, I think I could tell you some stories that would be consistent with that. And, and, but I, I honestly opt to not do that yeah. because I don't know if I want to even believe those stories, given that I know that there were dozens of organizations that moved the signature up. And if 
one or two have an anomalous result, and I start telling you about those, and I and I do a good job of making it memorable, and you act on that advice, I would feel that I'm harming the world rather than helping the world um, by getting you to focus on what I don't necessarily believe. So the answer to your question is yes, there are some things that look sort of like success stories, but uh, but I, I've already said net net, I don't think that moving the signature up has a significant influence on claimant behavior at this point. Okay, thank you. So I wanted to ask you one uh, one final question uh, for today. Um, Great. As as we move towards touchless or uh, lower touch claims, um, do you believe? Uh, that there is a greater likelihood for um, the general individual to commit fraud when there's little human involvement. So, uh, for example, <laughs> chatting uh, chatting with a human versus uh, chatting with a, uh, a chatbot over the internet. Um, you know, it's typically said in numerous studies that it's easier to lie to a computer uh, than it is to someone's face. And we kind of see this all the time, right? In social media, uh, you can write a response to an unknown person or what looks to be a computer online that you typically wouldn't say to someone's face. Um, would we would we expect the amount of fraud in a touchless uh, or low touch scenario to skyrocket? And I ask this especially because many organizations that we speak to are having to move as fast as possible to such technology in times like this where uh, there are difficulties for face-to-face -face interaction, uh, for adjusters to go out and look at things with COVID, uh, social distancing, and, and working from home. Uh, so I'm intrigued as to whether you think that is going to cause uh, a significant increase in the amount of opportunistic fraud in the industry. Um, terrific question. And, and, and your question is even broader than the industry in the sense of uh, with more and more things being done online, um, sort of integrity of communication and interaction um, becomes an issue. And I think a lot of people have the intuition that people are more willing to, to, um, uh, to be dishonest online than they would be in a face-to-face um, -face conversation. Um, and and I, I think I follow that intuition. But I, but I think that, that question is being asked in the vacuum of if we ask the same question without thinking about how we ask it. And now I'm gonna flip it again and, and, and talk about why I think that this revolution in the insurance company is, is, is coming. I, I actually think that with effective use of behavioral science, there are things that you can do online that you would have a harder time doing in more traditional ways of interacting with the claimant that could dramatically improve honesty. Um, so again, the, uh, so rather than thinking about moving the signature, what, what I'm most intrigued about about the slice signing process is both parties sign up front and make a commitment to tell the truth. Um, I'll give you one other example. There, there are many pieces that are that are now embedded within the slice structure. But an, another one is to ask a claimant for a two-minute video description of the claim as simply as possible. And one notion is you might get useful information from the video. But another notion is, um, if you're taking a video of me, which you're going to have available for approximately forever, um, and I might be prone toward exaggeration, am I as likely to sort of be dishonest in a video recording as I would be if I'm simply filling out a form? And, and now that everybody has a has a um, iPhone or a similar device with them at all times and can create two-minute video recordings, that's simply something that didn't exist for the, um, for the claims adjuster dealing with the claim 15 years ago, talking to the claimant for the first time over the phone. So, so, so the answer is yes, there are things that allow for dishonesty online 
But there are also, I think, many more things through the use of effective behavioral science that allows us to bring down the dishonesty through the use of effect, the effective combination of technology and behavioral science. So if I was to follow that up with, um, you know, a lot, a lot of insurance companies and people interested in, uh, in behavioral science and insurance will be listening to this uh, today. If you were to name a, a, a couple or select a couple of um, recommendations for insurance companies um, to take into account or discuss, uh, not for the detection, but for the prevention yeah. um, of fraud at, in the claims process, uh, what would they be? So start with take the perspective of your claimant. Okay, try to understand what they experience when they're making a claim with your company and think about what it is that, that you're doing that may allow people to justify exaggeration or even downright fraud. So what are you doing that allows that? Um, what behaviors could you engage in to make your company more honest and to convey that honesty in a transparent way and use that as a base to then say, how do I create a claims process that would induce the claimant to be um, transparent and honest in return? Um, if you think about, um, about human interaction and you think about the last time someone apologized to you, there's a pretty good chance you said, I'm sorry too. And it may be the case that the last time someone yelled at you, you yelled back. Humans tend to reciprocate and insurance companies should be thinking about how the system that they've been involved in, perhaps for decades, might be part of the reason why the other side feels comfortable acting in a less than transparent way and not acting with the mutuality of the way the insurance industry was created centuries ago. So audit your own behavior. Once you've done that and you, you're actually being honest and transparent, not gouging, so we certainly have insurance products out there that are gouging the consumer. So if you're acting in a high integrity way, I think it's actually very viable with a um, digital interface to do the kinds of things that I've been talking about in terms of mutual signing first, video recordings, asking the right questions that would lead to dramatically higher levels of honesty from your claimant. And not only would you be better off, but your claimant would be better off and you probably have a customer that would be sticking with you for a longer period of time. That's a great answer. Thank you, Max. Um, so I, I just want to say thank you for your time today. Um, it really is greatly appreciated. Um, and it was, uh, it was an honor to interview you, especially uh, after reading your book. Um, I, I enjoyed the conversation personally. Uh, truly fascinating. And I, I look forward to being in touch, hopefully, in the future. Uh, and of course, reading more of your wonderful books. Uh, and uh, as a plug, uh, for Max, uh, although this wasn't planned. Um, if you haven't already pre-ordered uh, Max's latest book, Better Not Perfect, I highly recommend that you do. Um, I read it um, faster than I've read most books recently. Uh, it was it was a great, uh, great read and um, lots more of uh, where this came from today um, in, uh, included in the book. So thank you, Max, again, and uh, talk to you again soon. Thank you, Dan. Thank, thanks for allowing me to talk with your audience. I, I really appreciate that, and um, I enjoyed our interaction. Perfect. Thank you.